There are really four main ways uh, in which we harness the sun's energy. Uh, the first is um, called, or we'll call it indirect, the indirect use of solar heat and light. Um, because sometimes, you know, even without trying, we use the sun's energy to, to warm us up and, and light up our day. Uh, so indirect use of the sun's energy, um, it could be as simple as going outside to warm yourself up by sitting in the sun. Um, and it could also be more deliberate, like by designing your buildings to optimize light and heat gain from the sun. Um, you know, for example, we talked about having thermal mass uh, built, designed into your building in order to capture heat uh, during the day and, and release it at night when you need it, when temperatures drop. Um, so typically indirect solar heat gain uh, and uh, indirect solar heat and light use is, uh, is thought of through the efficiency lens. Um, uh, it's not measured, you know, it doesn't show up in our pie charts of energy production and, and consumption by energy resource. Um, if it did show up in our pie charts, it would probably be uh, some, one of the most used energy resources uh, all over the world today, um, greater than coal, oil, and, and natural gas. But, but because uh, this indirect use of solar energy is, is more relevant uh, to, to the building energy efficiency conversation, I'm not going to focus on it today. Um, Peter Rumsey will, though, more in a couple of weeks. So the second method of solar energy use is called uh, direct um, use of uh, solar thermal energy. Um, and uh, that involves using any sort of simple heat trapping material uh, to capture heat from the sun and transfer it to various end uses like household water or space heating or swimming pool heating is actually the most common in, in the US. Um, the third uh, method is solar photovoltaic or PV, solar PV, which, uh, as I mentioned, it generates electricity from sunlight, uh, not from heat, but from sunlight, uh, by wiring different types of semiconductor material together in a circuit that can generate a current when hit by photons. The fourth method, uh, solar thermoelectric, it's also commonly referred to as concentrating solar power or CSP. Uh, this fourth method, it uses mirrors to reflect and concentrate sunlight onto centralized receivers uh, that convert that collected solar energy into heat. Um, and then that heat can be used uh, to turn a steam turbine to generate electricity. Um, so in the second method, uh, the direct use of solar, uh, there are really no energy conversions. Uh, you just use the solar thermal heat directly for whatever heating application you have. Uh, the third and fourth methods, uh, they both use energy conversions to generate electricity from, from solar energy, but in fairly different ways, right? Um, photovoltaics generates electricity through the electrochemical processes, and CSP generates electricity through the more traditional thermoelectric processes that we've been using to generate electricity from, uh, from fossil fuel resources and, and, and uranium for well over a century now. Direct use of solar energy, uh, as you can see in this chart, it's actually historically been the most prominent method that we've harnessed the solar resource worldwide, excluding indirect, um, which as we talked about, it isn't measured. Um, and direct solar thermal heat is still experiencing growth today, um, but it's not quite as much as the growth that's being experienced by solar PV. Um, because innovation and cost declines in the solar PV technology uh, have been so rapid and um, over the past decade or so. Um, and uh, that technology and use has experienced a lot of growth in our energy mix. Um, in 2017, solar PV surpassed the solar thermal heat uh, in terms of installed capacity. As you can see, it's larger here. Okay, so let's jump into talking about uh, the direct use of solar thermal heat. Uh, so as I talk about, uh, the, as I mentioned, the direct use of solar thermal heat uh, is uh, typically involves using uh, any sort of simple heat tra trapping mechanism or material uh, to capture heat from, from the sun and transfer it to various end uses. Uh, the biggest use of direct solar heat worldwide is for uh, domestic hot water heating uh, in both single family homes and multifamily homes here, uh, these two bars in the middle. Um, this is showing a percentage, uh, the, the darker blue is percentage of cumulative capacity and the lighter blue is percentage of, of 2018 capacity additions. 
So the majority of these domestic hot water heater uh, heating capacity is actually located in, in China. Um, China has historically been a leader in, in solar hot water heating, not, not necessarily actually driven by policy, as you might think, but because of early entrepreneurship by a few companies who recognized the economic opportunity to, to develop and install these solar hot water heaters um, in a low cost way. Um, but uh, even though China is kind of a leader in total installations, only about 10 to 15% of rooftops in China have solar hot water heaters on them. Um, but there are other countries uh, that are leaders, more leaders than, than China on a per rooftop basis, um, including Israel and Cyprus, both of which have, I think, over 90% of households equipped with these uh, domestic solar hot water heaters. Um, solar hot water heating systems are not that prevalent in the US, uh, except with some exceptions in states like Hawaii, uh, where solar hot water heaters are mandated for new buildings. Um, and there's, they're also pretty prevalent in Florida. But the next biggest use of uh, worldwide solar thermal heating after domestic hot water heating, uh, by, but by a long margin, is swimming pool heating. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a few countries like the US and Australia where uh, um, the largest application of solar thermal heating is the swimming pool heating. And then the final use case that I want to talk about are, uh, is using solar thermal heat for, uh, in the industrial sector, in particular for process heat. And I mentioned uh, that in the US, uh, a major portion in the energy efficiency lecture when we talked about energy end use is a major portion of energy use for in the industrial sector is for that process heat, um, the orange bar here. And that's the case you know, around the world as well. Um, all right, so uh, solar thermal heat, you know, today uh, as a percentage of overall solar thermal capacity, um, so solar thermal heat in the industrial sector is relatively small, but there's a lot of growth happening uh, uh, with applications of, of solar thermal heating in things, uh, areas like food and metal processing, textiles, uh, beverages, the beverage industry, and um, uh, even enhanced oil recovery um, as well. But I, I, I just want to take a moment to, to talk about the climate aspect of um, sort of process heat in the industrial sector, uh, because it's pretty clear how we can reduce our uh, and eventually eliminate greenhouse gases from uh, the biggest energy end use sectors of the economy, like electricity, transportation, and, and buildings. Um, because for these sectors, uh, you know, we have economic and scalable solutions like electrification of our transportation fleet and electrification of buildings uh, while we transition the electricity sector uh, to more wind and solar. Um, but for process heating, like uh, in the industrial sector, the pathway for, for low carbon is a little, is a little less clear. Um, there's still a need for, for innovation to develop kind of competitive and scalable low carbon alternatives for process heat that aren't um, met by natural gas and oil. Um, and to give you a sense, in 2019, industrial process heat accounted for about 12% of US greenhouse gas emissions. One alternative that's not solar heat actually would be uh, something like blue or green hydrogen. Um, but uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of growth happening in, in the industrial uh, solar heat for, for, for process heating. And there are some companies like uh, one called Heliogen that are developing solar thermal heating systems that, that use reflectors or mirrors to concentrate the heat um, with temperatures that can reach uh, a, a thousand degrees Celsius or higher, because you really need that high temperature heat for, uh, for that process heating. Um, and, and getting the high temperature heat uh, from solar thermal uh, to the levels that you need is one of the, one of the biggest challenges. Okay, so we talked about the applications of solar thermal heating, but let's actually talk about the different technologies or, or collector types. And there are really four main, main types of collectors for solar thermal heat. Uh, and they all vary in terms of insulation, uh, efficiency, uh, temperature or heat output, um, as well as capital cost. And when I say insulation, uh, I don't mean insulation, um, like with the solar resource that we talked about earlier but I'm talking about insulation materials that help retain the heat. 
Um, because as you can imagine, you know, if you have more insulation materials, uh, your efficiency and operating temperatures increase um, and your capital costs will increase as well. So the first type listed here, unglazed, it's the most basic uh, type of collector. It doesn't have any insulation. Um, the word glazing uh, in general in the energy industry refers to whether or not there is any glass or other kind of similar transparent material added as insulation. Uh, so unglazed collectors, they uh, simply use a heat, heat conducting material to absorb the sunlight and transfer it to a fluid passing behind the heat, heat conducting material. And they work similar to how, you know, if you pick up a garden hose that's uh, been in the sun, uh, you know, the water in it is, is warm um, uh, because the garden hose has absorbed the sun's energy and transferred it to the water within the hose. Um, so uh, this kind of simple collector technology, it's, it's um, pretty low temperature, low, low heat output, um, and is best for lower heating applications like, like for swimming pool heating. So the second one here is the glazed uh, flat plate collectors, and they typically include uh, metal tubing inside an insulated box that's uh, coated with a clear glazing, uh, which is typically glass, uh, and that provides insulation to better retain the heat. Uh, the best application for the glazed flat plate uh, is domestic solar hot water heating, um, and uh, because of that, they're the second most used uh, types of collectors in the world, uh, making up about a quarter of world installations today. The most used collector though is the evacuated tube um, uh, collector, which makes up about 70% of, of installations. And they're distinguished by the fact that they uh, have metal, metal tubes, uh, typically copper, that are surrounded by a double wall of glass that's vacuum sealed. Um, and that serves as additional insulation, similar to how um, many of our water bottles and thermoses are vacuum sealed to, to keep our drinks cold or hot for, um, for hours. So uh, these evacuated tube collectors, as you might imagine, um, have a higher heat output and can be used in uh, not only domestic hot water heating, but also commercial hot water heating and, and some lo lower temperature industrial processes. And uh, finally, then you have the concentrating solar thermal collectors uh, that use reflectors to concentrate uh, light onto a small area um, to generate even higher temperature heat. Um, and this, this is distinguished though from CSP, which generates electricity. Um, so adding that electricity generation process definitely changes the economics and the operations of, of, uh, of the system. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, the concentrating solar thermal uh, uh, collectors are, they're, they're not that common today, but there's a lot of growth happening because of their use in, in growing industrial applications. And uh, to give an interesting example, there was a one gigawatt thermal Mara concentrating solar steam generating plant in Oman that was used for enhanced oil recovery. And that came online in 2017. So it's a fairly big, big project. And um, let's see, might be, have made up a lot of this, this growth that you see here. 